Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, it's Angie Chang here. We have today Sophia Pearl, a director of product management at Oath, and she will be talking to us about how to stay relevant in the tech economy. Hand it over to you. Uh, thank you, Angie. Hi, everyone. Um, like Angie said, I'm Sophia. I'm here to share with you my top tips for staying relevant in the tech economy. Some of the topics that I'm going to cover are the first one is where can you find inspiration for figuring out what you should learn more about and then next i'll share with you some of my tips of how i set up my home environment to really encourage and commit myself to learning and then lastly i'll share with you some stories where i've applied newly skilled um, newly learned skills to side projects and even at work so I just want to warn everyone too, uh, my slides are full screen, so I can't see all the comments that are happening, but Angie is here to help me. So she'll let me know if there's anything that you guys are talking about that I should know about. All right, so a little bit about myself. You just heard from Angie. I work at Oath. I've previously have worked at eBay and IBM in a variety of engineering and product positions. I've worked in ads, marketplaces, identity, and databases. On my personal side of life, I am one half of a full-time working couple. I do have kids and I am known for breaking or bruising parts of my body from snowboarding. And um, no, they're not from doing the half pipe. It's really just trying to get to the bottom of the hill. All right, let's get started. How many of you have seen this Atari breakout game? One of the things that I love about this game is how similar it is to our industry and to our roles and responsibilities. So imagine that you're this paddle at the bottom of the screen going back and forth. The ball is a skill set and the blocks are tests that you have at work. So as you're going about in your day, you're knocking out these tests with all these skill sets that you have in like your toolbox. Every once in a while, your skill set you don't have that skill set. And so you find it more challenging to tackle these tasks. And this is how I think about the tech industry, especially. There's so many things that are changing and it's hard for us to keep up. Um, I know for, for me personally, I, I'm always trying to learn things and always not having the time to do and learn everything, it's been quite a challenge. So that brings us to, we're super busy people. This is pretty obvious. There was actually a study done by the US Bureau of Labor who looked at how much time does a working professional spend on any given day? And what you'll see here is for educational activities, we spend less than seven minutes a day. And then if you take a look at leisure and sports, which is just a couple rows down, we're spending up to like four hours on leisure and activities. I mean, I get it, we all need to relax and and work out, but I think there is some focus that maybe we need to shift some of our time for educational activities. Another related study, this is by the Pew Researcher, 63% of us consider ourselves life learners. So I would like everyone just mentally ask yourself, what bucket of learners are you? Are you a life learner or are you a non-life learner? As we look at articles and additional studies, we know that we need skills for the future. One of those skills is life learning, be able to consume information continually and sort of adapt with our changing environment. We also know that people who are life learners do benefit in the workplace. So they're able to expand their professional network, advance within the current in their organization. So up until this point, we've established that our industry is continually changing. Our roles and responsibilities are continually changing. We don't have a lot of time to dedicate to learning, but we know that for the future, we need to be a life learner, and we know that life learners do benefit in the workplace. So now what I wanna do is share with you some of my tips on how to get us into life learning mode. So the first topic is where do you look for to pick a focus for what you wanna learn more about? Now this slide, I would say it's more of a baseline. Um, I hope it's nothing new for many of you, but it's 
you know, really understanding what's going on in your industry, your company, the competitors, and even your role and responsibilities yourself. So you can get a lot of this information from news blogs and newsletters. Um, but most importantly, if you're thinking about perfecting your craft, someone actually gave me this idea where they said, hey, Sophia, if you really want to understand what it takes to be a great PM at different companies or even at your own companies, start being an interviewer. So start thinking about sort of a forcing function. Think about what I would look for in a person in terms of their skill set and how would I assess that this person possesses these skills? And is it a good fit for the team that we're hiring for for Oath? And also, is it a good fit for the company? So if some of you are not doing interviews on behalf of your company, I highly recommend that you do that because it does sort of forces you to think more about um, assessing yourself and also assessing what is a great fit for the team and the company that's hiring. My personal favorite on where I could find inspiration on what I should be learning about is really uh, tapping into my professional and my friends network. And what I mean by this is earlier we established that everyone is super busy. Why not have people do the heavy lifting for you? So every once in a while, I'll reach out to my friends or my first professional network and I'll ask them, hey, you know, what are you currently learning? What do you think I should be learning? And, and it's, it's super relevant when you are reaching out to folks who work in the same industry that you're in or even the vertical and who are doing similar roles and responsibilities as you. So I highly recommend reach out to your personal network, have them do the heavy lifting um, and see what curated list they already have and use that as another set of ideas. Lastly, as all of us, I'm assuming all of us here are leaders are really aspiring to be leaders. One of the things that I highly recommend and has worked very well for me is consider taking a self-assessment. And what this helps you do is really understand the under the hood, like why do you operate the way you do at work? You know, understanding your communication style, how you um, collaborate with others. So about, I would say like two, three weeks ago, I actually took the insights discovery test. And the way this test works is it sort of identifies which colors you're most comfortable operating in. So you have cool, blue, red, yellow, and green. And so usually people fall into like two to three colors in terms of your colors that you're most familiar with, the ones that you sort of uh, leverage naturally. And what I liked about this is it, it sort of informed me what colors that I fall into, but it also talked about how I should be perceiving others and what colors they may be and how I would interact with them coming from a different color perspective. So again, um, we sort of went through looking at your industry and company. We looked at maybe even perfecting your craft for specifically for your role and uh, responsibilities. And then lastly, looking at so sort of soft skills, like how do you like to operate? And this is really um, relevant for people who want to move up in the leadership track. All right, so the next set of tips that I have is how do you set up your day-to-day -day life to help you commit to learn? So once you figure out what you wanna learn about, so again, that's a very personal choice, depends on you know, what skill sets you have, when you figure that out, then it's looking at, okay, how do I make the time in my day so that I'm continually learning? So this is a diagram I, I ran into recently and I really like it. It's by uh, author Edgar Dale. And what it talks about is that there's many different methods for learning. And what he advocated is that you wanna leverage multiple methods so that you could show, you know, learn the breadth and the depth. A particular topic and if there's like one thing that you take away from my talk this is like the one thing I would want you to take away I think we all have learning methods that really resonates well with us meaning when we learn through a certain method the content like sticks a lot and if it's something uh, similar to what I go through 
that's usually like reading a book or taking a class. But I would love everyone to open up your minds and think about, look, you could either wait for that perfect moment where you dedicate a lot of time and maybe energy to do your preferred learning method, or you could actually maybe, um, I would say get your second or third best learning method. And, and I'll show you that in the next slide, but think about like finding opportunities where the learning method meshes more well with like your day-to-day -day life, instead of finding that perfect moment where you have to dedicate a lot of time to learn about something. So that's just, just something to keep in mind. So I'll give you an example. In the next slide, all of these apps I've used one point in my life. Um, the one that actually sticks out the most is Overdrive, which is like a free version of Audible. So Audible is the monthly subscription that you get on Amazon. You pay $15 a month for access to a bunch of audiobooks. Overdrive is actually connected to your local library. So if you don't have a library card already, I encourage all of you to go get a local library card and then hook it up to Overdrive. And what Overdrive allows you to do is to download eBooks or download audiobooks for free. And I actually did a sort of a side-by-side -side comparison between what I could find at my library and what I could find at Audible. And I found about 70 to 80% of the books that I was personally interested in, I could find for free on Overdrive. So um, consider leveraging apps to help make it easier to consume information. All right, so on this slide, in conjunction with leveraging apps, you wanna think about what devices you wanna be using and for what, when you would use those devices. So this is a, so Angie, this is one of the times I'm gonna like ask people questions here. So uh, she'll sort of summarize, but for me on the left-hand side, this is my setup. So in the morning, I would love people to guess, like where do you think this is, like what room in my house and bonus points, if you could tell me specifically in, in uh, what area in the room do you think this setup is? So in the morning, I have an Echo Dot, I have two waterproof speakers, and I have an iPhone horror. You're in the shower, in the shower and someone has a kitchen. Yes. <laughs> kitchen is actually a good one. I do have an Echo in the kitchen, but yes, this is in the shower. So I don't do this all the time, but I have been known to watch YouTube videos of people lecturing or different workshops, um, I have it pressed up to my screen or to the, to the glass of my shower door. And then I listen to the talks while I'm in the shower. So if you think about it, what, what times do you have where you could actually listen to content? So for me in the shower, I'm spending like 15, 20 minutes in the shower. Um, and then you could read the rest driving and, and, and in the evenings. In the evenings, it's great for me because I'm actually not multitasking as much. But after, you know, I've put my kids to bed and later in the evenings, that's when I find time to meet with people who are more flexible in terms of meeting um, late evening. So I have my laptop and phone, so I usually do hangouts and so forth. Um, and if you are considering leveraging devices, which I highly encourage, think about leveraging IoT devices because it's, uh, you're sort of killing two birds with one stone. You're using it to consume information but then you're also leveraging it to be an early adopter of an IoT uh, technology like tech gadgets. All right, so the last section is just do it. I wanna give you some examples of how I've taken, you know, what I've learned recently and apply it to side projects and at work. So here is my first example. So when I first coded my first iOS app, I was PM at the time. I had attended two hackathons, made some friends along the way who ended up being my mentors on developing these apps. And I also got a bunch of books and got a MacBook to code apps. My first app that I coded is, I called it Event Tabulous. I still have the domain name. Um, so that's super, eventtabulous.com. Doesn't do anything but show this app. But what it does is I was really into events and I loved networking. And so I thought, you know, why not put that passion and apply it to something that I'm also trying to learn about, which is developing apps. So what it does is based on your current location, it will tell you your events, um, events that are located near you within 20 to 30 miles. 
it will show you nearby tweets. I was thinking, hey, look, if I can monitor the tweets near the location, maybe it tells me if it's a good or bad event. And then lastly, you get directions to event. So I was leveraging at the time as Yahoo upcoming events API. I was leveraging the Twitter API and I was leveraging the Google Maps API. The second app that I ended up coding was uh, actually had got better adoption and it was a uh, surprisingly it's called pick predict and it was a, a, a picture fortune telling app. So every week I actually consistently got 20 to 40 downloads. Um, I completed the app during my maternity leave. So it was a, uh, I was towards the end when I was getting a little bit more sleep. Fun fact, this app used to be called magic create ball. I was trying to put a spin on sort of a flexible magic eight ball. So if any of you know the, the Mattel magic eight ball where you shake and it sort of says your fortune, I did have that name and then iTunes uh, rejected it because of trademark. So I had to change it to pick predict. Um, but yeah, uh, I made two apps. Uh, really, it was for fun, but I really, I would say the, the lessons learned from going through this process is I wanted to build something from idea to, you know, to market. And I, I did everything on my own. I came up with the graphics and I coded everything. So it was a great experience. And I would say it was my first foray in like mobile apps in general. I want to share another example, and this one is more relevant to work. Um, and it's a small example, and it's more of just to show you that it doesn't have to be a big project or big thing that you have to apply this new skill to. You just need to find small ways where you're incorporating things that you're learning outside of work. And this one in particular, I really wanted to hone in on my brainstorming skills. And I was asking around on a women in product Slack group, like, you know, what what, what are the, some of the ideas or what should I be referencing? And someone recommended the Sprint book, which is the Google Design Sprint. Um, basically, it talks about you know, a five-day process where you go from idea to prototest and, uh, prototype and putting it in front of a customer at the end of the week. And so I read more about it and I actually had friends who had taught workshops on this. So it was great that I had friends that were teaching people and had also applied it at work. And I ended up, using it to generate ideas for a product roadmap. And the results of that, I, I actually, a lot of the ideas that came out of it ended up on my roadmap. And I also had people who had never done it before who told me they really enjoyed the process. And it was, uh, I ended up being a doer and a teacher for this, um, for this project. So that, that was pretty cool. All right. So before, actually, one more thing I want to put before I go to this slide is as you think about the, the trends and the technologies that you're learning and outside of work, one of the things that I also try to do is think about how does that technology apply to work? And, and maybe it doesn't apply initially to work. Maybe it's uh, more thinking big box on like, how would you use the technology? So to give you an example, I work in ads, you know, how would self-driving cars be applied to ads? Is it, you know, ads showing up on the speaker, ads on the outside of the car? I mean, it, it really gets your juices going and it gives you really a broader perspective on what you could bring to the table when you're talking with your colleagues, when you're brainstorming ideas. I would also recommend thinking about pulling apart the technology. So I'll just stick with self-driving cars. You know, it has sensors, different cameras. You know, how is that, how can the, you know, image recognition be applied to something that you're doing at work? So it may not necessarily be self-driving cars in, it, in its entirety, but maybe it's parts of it that could be applied. So that's a, another tip to keep in mind. All right, so let's go to this slide. You could benefit from showing off your newly learned skills. So as I sort of explained a little bit earlier, you solidify your learning by doing and also by teaching. And eventually that makes you a subject matter expert in the area. So think about that, about how you could bring your outside skills and use that at work and then become more relevant as you know, your team is looking to build skills in certain areas. And maybe you actually lead that initiative at work. And then lastly, I know from personal experience that I have gotten noticed by hiring managers. 
So as I talked about those two apps that I had worked, worked on, that was during a time that I was at IBM working on very large scale enterprise software. And the apps uh, showed another side of me that other companies weren't considering, which is, hey, look, she could build consumer apps. She understands the consumer side of the house. So that's something to keep in mind as well. All right, wrap up. So we went over how to pick a focus, how you could commit to learn, and how you could just, just do it, applying what you just learned to the workplace and maybe even side projects. That's it. Thank you, Sophia. Uh, I think we are out of time. That was a fantastic presentation. Got a lot of great feedback and then chatter. If you would like to answer questions, you can answer them on Twitter and hashtag them GGX Elevate and we will retweet them and people can get your answers. But we have to move on now to our next speaker. So thank you so much for coming in and joining us for this fantastic presentation. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. Right. Super.